Hello, I'm Professor Cyrus Sotsis and welcome to this week's lecture. We're going to be talking about movies. And if you're watching this, I'm guessing you're in one of my intro to mass communication classes. Maybe not, but um, this usually is the case for why you're watching one of my videos. Um, so why don't I go right to the PowerPoint, which includes all the content from uh, the textbook. That's what most of these uh, lectures are based on. And so let's go to the lecture and the PowerPoint, which again is based on movies, the exciting genre of film, one of my favorites. Um, here we go. Let me back. So these are first of learning outcomes from the previous lecture where I talked about radio. Um, so this is just a friendly reminder of that. Uh, and really, when you think about movies, you have to start with the invention of the motion picture. And Thomas Edison, one of the most brilliant human beings on the planet, um, is responsible for inventing many things, including the light bulb. That's what he's most famous for. But he also was at least partly responsible for what's called the kinetoscope. It's a device that would become the predecessor to what we know today as a motion picture projector, although that precedes uh, digital uh, uh, devices now. That screen films and the kinetoscope was invented by Thomas Edison together with his assistant William Dixon who was his lab assistant one interesting note with the kinetoscope is that uh, there was no patent associated with that why he didn't include a patent for that I really have no idea um, but uh, the kinetoscope featured a celluloid films strip uh, and again the kinetoscope was a foundation of motion pictures um, and the, the celluloid film strip is a sequence of images uh, that are rapidly spoon, spooled, I'm sorry, between a light bulb and a lens, creating the illusion of motion. Um, and this is the same pre uh, premise for animation as well, but this is where movies and film first started. Um, and these soon were featured in hotels, amusement parks, and penny arcades, which were called that because people can just literally use a penny. Um, and again, Edison didn't patent the, t the kinetoscope, so when the kinetoscope was invented, you had a lot of imitations, you had a lot of different versions of this. Um, again, and, and the why of the, of the lack of a patent is in question. I mean, some people have answers for this. Uh, the textbook talks about the, this briefly. But again, this is we're talking more just about the history of it right now. Um, and this eventually led to the cinematograph, um, which was a lightweight film projector that also functioned as a camera and a printer. Um, August and Louis Lumiere, the Lumiere brothers, invented it in Lyon, France in 1895. Uh, and this resulted in the first film ever, which was called Workers Leaving the Lumiere Factory. And, and a lot of these early films that I talk about in this lecture today are actually available on YouTube. You can watch these clips. Um, George Melisse is obviously is featured in the textbook for great reason. Um, he was a Parisian cinema owner who experimented with special effects to create trick films and was the first to introduce narratives to film before uh before Melise, uh there were no stories of film it was just basically shots of various human beings in action or of settings Melise decided to bring narratives he decided to basically bring what we, we traditionally would know as a play or a fictionalized story onto film um, and a trip to the moon was one of those first films ever and again this is also available on youtube if you ever do want to see this then Nickelodeon theaters were shortly after introduced. They were called this because you literally paid five cents to enter them. Um, these were the first film theaters in the United States. Uh, and again, as I mentioned a moment ago, they were called this because it was a five cent admission charge, thus the nickel. Um, and the Great Train Robbery was the first major box office hit. And, uh, and again, if you Google the, the Great Train Robbery or just put it in the search engine of YouTube, um, the Great Train Robbery um, actually does, uh, you can actually see the film, and, it, and, it's, and it's kind of entertaining, actually, if you watch it. It's just a bunch of people, uh, uh, robbers who rob a train, um, and the Motion Picture Patents Company was introduced here as well, so that people don't violate copyright uh, with films. Um, so then Hollywood emerged, right? So the film industry decided, all right, we need to have a home base for our industry, and they picked Hollywood, Southern California, because of the weather, just like the, the primary reason why everyone moves to California, that, it really is a true story, by the way. I would think social freedoms play a large part as well, but the weather plays a large part. Um, and in 1915, more than 60% of U.S. film production was centered in Hollywood. Um, and this led to eventually an evolution and uh, of new film techniques. This included parallel editing, where a film alternates between two or more scenes of action. 
Um, panning shots were introduced, which establishes a, scene, a sense of scene and engages the audience more fully. In other words, the camera or the shot is moving in the process. Um, and whereas with parallel editing, you basically have different scenes. Prior to all these new film techniques, it was just one shot on one camera, typically with just one uh, roll of film. Um, and then tracking shots traveled with the movement of a scene. Um, an example being a, a train robbery scene and a second track with the camera moving with the train would be an example of that, or car chase scenes in, in modern days. And this allowed the audience to participate in the film's action. Um, and D.W. Griffith, who is a very controversial figure in Hollywood, was credited for making these advancements in filmmaking, but um, he also has, there's very strong allegations of racism toward him, justifiably so. If you'd like to research that, you're welcome to. So D.W. Griffith is very controversial, given that, again, he created all these, uh, or a lot of these film techniques, but he also uh, espoused a lot of uh, a hateful content, both in his films and in other content he produced. Um, the Motion Picture Association of America was soon introduced, the MPAA. Uh, prominent industry figures included D.W. Griffith, who I just mentioned a moment ago, Charlie Chaplin, hopefully all of you, or at least most of you have heard that name, Mary Pickford, Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle, and Douglas Fairbanks. These are examples of early film stars, prominent filmmakers, um, and public attitudes back then were similar today. Many viewed Hollywood as a threat to the moral fabric of the country. Um, you know, when you talk about, uh, when you hear all these stereotypes about, you know, uh, liberal Hollywood activists and stuff, this would, this would be going on for over a century now. Um, and a, an example of that is, is Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. Uh, and the textbook goes into this in more detail, but he was acquitted of rape and the murder of actress Virginia Rapp. Um, and despite the fact that he was acquitted, uh, this still led to censorship of his films and other, other edgy films as well. He became highly controversial because of that, and the MPAA instituted a co code of self-censorship for the motion picture industry. And what is that censorship? The ratings, the MPAA ratings, which we have today. Uh, there was the G rating, which was g suitable for general audiences. There is the M rating, which was first introduced, and that's the equivalent to the PG rating today. And eventually M got split into two parts, PG and PG-13. The R rating still exists today. Uh, which is restricted to uh, adults over the age of 16. So 17 and over can watch R-rated films. And then NC-17, which is originally called X-rated films, um, you have to be an adult regardless. Uh, and you see similar ratings like this with video games, with TV shows. They have different labels attached to them. This is more for film, but this started the whole rating process to try to protect young people primarily from consuming violent and or sexual and graphic type uh, uh, content. Um, and the motion picture industry evolved and so did the films, right? Warner Brothers produced um, Vitaphone technology, which merged sound with film, because in the early days, obviously, you had a, you had a lot of silent pictures and silent film. Um, Don Juan and another film called The Jazz Singer were the first films that actually had sound in them. Um, the Jazz Singer was the first film ever that had an actor's voice associated in it, where you can hear the actor actually talking. Um, in, by 1929, three quarters of Hollywood films had some sort of sound accompaniment, accompaniment whether it was a ambient sounds, whether it was actually hearing uh, the verbalization of the actors and actresses, um, whether it was music. Uh, and by 1930, silent films were a thing of the past. Um, Technicolor was soon introduced to films. In 1933, Three Little Pigs came out with color. Uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs came out in 1936 with color. The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind both came out in 1939 in color. And a huge reason why color took a while to, to, uh, to really expand and become prominent in films is because of the Great Depression. Technicolor is very, and was rather, was very expensive. Um, so it wasn't cheap to make films in color. So despite the fact that the technology was there, uh, it took a while for Hollywood to really um, implement a Technicolor into their films. But when you think about it, the fact that 1933 was the first color film, that is almost 100 years ago. It's, it's really wild. And the fact that two films that are still considered some of the greatest in film history with The Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind, these were produced in 1939. That is really crazy. Um, and Technicolor didn't become the norm until the 1940s, again, because of the Great Depression and the economic pressure uh, levied on pretty much all of society, including Hollywood. 
Um, and the movie studios arose as Hollywood became big. Um, in 1930, you had eight movie studios producing 95% of all American films in 1930. Uh, these companies included Warner Brothers, Metro Goldwyn Mayer, which is MGM, RKO, which in theory is still around. I think there's just one little office remaining. Uh, 20th Century Fox and Paramount. Um, were the most influential studios and were vertically, vertically integrated. Uh, the late 1930s and early 1940s were known as the golden age of cinema. Film, in its peak in 1939, was the 11th largest industry in the entire United States. That is very significant. And uh, during World War II, which was an incredible time of strife in our country, two-thirds of Americans were attending the theater. But what must go up also must come down, and that includes the movie studios. Uh, a, a, a legal case called United States versus Paramount Pictures led to the fall of the movie studios because this forced studios to relinquish control over theater chains. The U.S. government um, uh, uh, enacting antitrust measures uh, felt that the movie studios were just too big. They not only produced most of the films, but they also own most of the theater chains. And a huge concern with, with the, in terms of the U.S. government was propaganda. They didn't want any individual entity uh, controlling the message being, sent, being spread to uh, American society, given, again, two-thirds of Americans at its peak were going to the movie theaters each week. So the control of the major studios were reverted to Wall Street. It became corporatized. corporatized. Um, and so this chart right here, this was taken from the textbook, shows... Uh, the percentage of the U.S. population that went to the cinema weekly on average. And as you can see again, in 1930, it was a huge number, approximately 65%, but you had less people going. Uh, by, the, by World War II, again, two-thirds of, of Americans were going to the movie theaters on a weekly basis. And then you can start seeing a decline. Um, and and the, the decline here correlates directly with the rise of television. Um, people were able to start consuming visual mediums at home, and so less people started going to the movie theaters. And you've seen this, this number now plateau. Uh, my guess is the pandemic has caused a drastic dip, but we're also seeing people go back to movie theaters. Um, so you might see a dip and then maybe uh, a ebb directly vertical. Um, and the blockbusters are obviously a huge thing today, right? So in the 1960s and 70s, a new breed, of director emerged, right? Think of Francis Ford Coppola in the Godfather movies. Think of Steven Spielberg with Jaws, with E.T., um, George Lucas with Star Wars, and him and Steven Spielberg together doing Indiana Jones. Martin Scorsese doing a wide variety of movies focused whether, uh, uh, whether the theme was gangster movies, um, whether it was the, the uh, I forgot the name of the film with Paul Newman and Tom Cruise that, where they played pool. Um, he did Goodfellas. Uh, he did the boxing movie with De Niro. The point is, um, studios started investing more money in fewer films um, because of financial incentive. Uh, marketers discovered that if you double advertising costs on radio and TV, this could include profits as much as three or four times over. And this led to what you see today in terms of commercials, movie trailers, this heavy emphasis on promoting films, uh, whether you see actors promoting it with interviews on talk shows, commercials of movies everywhere, that is because it is a tried and true formula for successful films. And Hollywood studios, which were now run largely by international corporations, um, they, they started to have more of a profit motive with their films, and they favored the conservative gamble of the tried and true. That's why you see sequels. That's why you see um, movies that are they're franchised, for example. These are safe bets for them, right? So when you see Disney purchasing Star Wars and endlessly making movies, uh, the Obi-Wan Kenobi show is coming out on Disney Plus soon. Um, the Godfather movies, there were three of those. Indiana Jones is a fifth one coming out soon. That's my favorite movie character ever. Um, so the reason why you see, and obviously Marvel Studios is a huge thing, and the reason why you see so many of these, again, is because it's more marketable. It is easier to sell. Um, the emphasis uh, has strayed away from quality and on the artistic side of film and is focused, it focused instead more on um, what is most profitable, and that is where franchises 
uh, really come into play because they're much easier to market. People are more familiar with them. It's a safer bet for making money. And again, there's my favorite uh, movie character of all time, the most badass professor on the planet, Dr. Henry Indiana Jones Jr. I named my dog, rest in peace, after him. Because in the films, they made, the dog was named Indiana. Anyways, um, and then VCRs were introduced in 1975, which added to the movie audience. Um, first, uh, you, people saw films uh, on what's called beta cassettes, and then, it be, and then uh, VHS came out, and that was popular for decades until DVDs came out. Um, then Blu-rays came out. And then what we have today now is streaming primarily. And movie theaters are still around, though, which is very incredible. I mean, there's nothing that can replace a big screen experience. Um, the textbook highlights the difference between how the film industry covered World War II versus the Vietnam War, which is very fascinating and very interesting and important. Um, whereas with World War II films, there is generally an overwhelming patriotic theme to the films, right? Um, but Vietnam War films overwhelmingly denounced war and exposed the ugly side of it. Part of it was that technology let the media cover it more. Part of it was, whereas with World War II, there was a very clear bad guy, an enemy in, in the Nazi party and, and, and the, the triumvirate access of Germany, Italy, and Japan. Um, the Vietnam War, there was fairly no clear message in terms of why we were in a war to begin with. I and mean, we understood that we were fighting communism, but when thousands upon thousands of our troops started dying as a result of a fight that we didn't really know what was about, um, far more questions were raised. And, and that translated directly into films, so such movies as Dr. Strangelove in 1964, MASH in 1970, The Deer Hunter in 1978, fantastic film. I have not seen Dr. Strangelove yet. Um, Apocalypse Now in 1979, in my opinion, the greatest Vietnam War film ever produced uh, by Francis Ford Coppola. Platoon in 1986, great movie. Good Morning Vietnam in 1987 with Robin Williams. Uh, Born on the Fourth of July with Tom Cruise in 1989 and Full Metal Jacket in 1987 are just some examples of Vietnam War films that um, overwhelmingly denounced war and exposed the ugly side of it. Um, and of course, film does correlate directly with mass culture, right? So the effect of early mass communication media was to wear away regional differences and create a more homogenized, standardized culture. In other words, it was a unifying measure for our country because everyone shared the cultures and beliefs and values that were espoused in the films we consumed. Um, film influences viewers uh, in terms of speech, dress, and behavior, depending on the common heroes that are on the screen. Um, the myth of the individual is perpetuated strongly in film, and this is a really a core difference between uh, American culture and other cultures around the world, whereas with other cultures, uh, the focus is largely on societal good, is largely on uh, a community and a connection of human beings. Here in the United States, uh, the focus with film with, and with a lot of uh, mass media and, and, uh, and a lot of the content that is disseminated is based on the myth of the individual. Um, meaning that the hero is just one person, that they're all alone, they, that one individual battles hundreds, not thousands of bad guys. From 1926 until 1967, Westerns accounted for nearly a quarter of all films produced, and a, and a general theme in those Westerns was the lone cowboy, a semi-nomadic wanderer who makes his way in a lawless and often dangerous frontier. Um, it's a Wonderful Life is another example, a movie still that this still airs every Christmas or near Christmas during the holidays, um, where an individual triumphs by standing up to injustice, reinforcing the belief that one person can make a difference in the world. And modern hero figures, Indiana Jones, again, my favorite uh, film character, uh, Luke Skywalker from Star Wars, modern comic book heroes ranging from Iron Man to Captain America to Wolverine, they emphasize individualism. And there is not that much of a coincidence that so many Americans value individualism, um, despite the potential selfishness that comes with that, uh, opposed to what other cultures feel is important, which is more the communal good. Um, and films represent a large reason for that, because they emphasize the myth of the individual. And the textbook covers this in great, in great detail as well. Now, in terms of the economics of movies, um, there used to be a big six, now there's five, Warner Brothers, Paramount, 
Universal, Columbia, and Disney. Disney purchased 20th Century Fox a few years back. So these are the big five Hollywood studios. They control over 95% of US film production today. And movies do cost a lot to make. The average production budget, not including marketing expenses for a film, is close to $65 million. And that number is probably even higher today. Um, Avatar, which was released all the way back in 2009, still waiting on the sequels. We're approaching 14 years later. Uh, cost close to $340 million to make. Um, and more specifically, to actually produce the film, $190 million. And then another $150 million in terms of a marketing budget. Um, and there's two types of costs that, that uh, uh, film producers look at. They're above the line costs and below the line costs. Above the line costs is negotiated before the filming begins. Um, and this includes screenplay rights. This includes salaries for writers, producers, directors, leading actors, uh, and their assistants, right? And these aren't fixed numbers typically. These are always negotiated, depends on the individual, whereas below the line costs are usually fixed. Um, and these include salaries for non-starring cast members, your technical crew, technical equipment, um, your locations, your travel, renting a studio, catering to feed everyone. These are costs that are already integrated into a film ahead of time. And typically your line producer is responsible for the budget of the film. Uh, a concept that I'm introducing to this, uh, I don't think the textbook really covers it much, but it's very important for you to learn if I haven't touched on this before. It's called disruptive technology. A scholar named Christensen in Europe uh, defines this, and he's brilliant when it comes to media studies especially, uh, he defines it as a technology so different that it allows a new population to access, to access a product or service that had been in the hands of a few. And examples of this include with the movie industry that we're talking about right now, we had once upon a time VHS, and even before that it was beta, uh, then you had DVDs, then you had Blu-rays, today most people consume their films with streaming services, and this, this, these constantly disrupt the movie industry, whereas bookstores were, were uh, disrupted by ebooks and e-commerce. There used to be a lot more bookstores out there than there are today. Uh, record stores, which used to be plentiful, uh, Tower Record is an example of that, a Virgin Megastore, they eventually got replaced by streaming services like the iCloud or Pandora, SoundCloud, Spotify. Hardly anyone these days owns a tangible product when it comes to music, although vinyl is still uh, relevant and a decent amount of people still buy that. Um, and computers, right? The, the publishing industry used to run on typewriters and computers obviously disrupted that. And then the media industry has been largely disrupted by social media and free media. Um, so make sure you're aware of this concept called disruptive technology, which does apply largely to the media. And last but not least, movies today have gone digital, both with recording devices, with projectors, and with the way you consume films, whether it's through Netflix, whether it's through Hulu, whether it's through Disney+, Plus, whether it's through HBO Max, um, the list is endless. So obviously things have changed, but the thing that remains the same is that people still love the content. They still love the narratives, they still love the stories, and the movie industry is not going anywhere. It's just maybe more so on a smaller screen, but even still the big screen exists as well for movies. And that is my lecture on movies today. And uh, hope you enjoyed it, and thank you.